Hi, I'm Shivaji Basu. I look after the industry advisory group. And at this time, uh, we are going to speak uh, uh, about a bit more about resilience. And that is, of course, one of the main topics that is dogging us uh, of late. And when, when we talk about resilience, uh, we are especially talking about the volatility that we see in the market today on one side. And that volatility is not only driven by, by uh, the, the pandemic, but also on certain industry segments where we see there is a high demand valuation, for example, in automotive industry. At the same time, on the supply side, we see a disruption. We see a disruption in the sense uh, that uh, not only in terms of pandemic, as I said, but also in certain part of the uh, supply chain, we see there are labor issues coming up. We see geographical uh, challenges coming up in certain areas which are more driven with the natural uh, events. And what we see is we are no longer in a phase where our demand cycles are as rhythmic as we have seen before. So, and our planning error is today susceptible to more disruptive, uh, uh, I would say, variants, number one. And the level of in, in, uh, unpredictability has, has risen. Now, looking at this, there is an important role that is to be played by finance. And uh, uh, finance is today having a manifesto which is little different from what it has conventionally had. And we would put that portfolio in, in three buckets. One is, uh, all of these, of course, has to do with uh, the element of uh, capital budgeting. And one of the aspects of has to invest and reallocation in alternative supply chains, especially when we are seeing that one of the ways to hedge, uh, hedge the market volatility and the disruptions is how do we create alternative echelons of supply chain, which means facilities, new partners, and logic echelons, I've said, so that we are able to bring in the continuity that is required in global uh, flow of inventory and demand fulfillment. The second aspect is that as we see that there is a credit volatility happening, striking the credit balance with the suppliers uh, uh, and maintaining that despite the receivable side being little more variant is another working capital management challenge that for a higher variance, which means availability have to live up the resource allocation needs to support new planning and planning algorithms and paradigms that we see here. Now, talking about uh, planning, uh, we have a very dis distinguished uh, panelist here. We have Phil Baldock, who, who, who comes from a significant finance and supply chain planning background. He is the executive vice president of Verif uh, Verifone and where he has driven significant transformation in finance and supply chain. He was the CIO of, of uh, ERIS, where he is known for not only um, digital transformation uh, levers like out migration, but also bringing in the cohesion between supply chain planning and finance. A chartered management uh, accountant himself, Phil will help us understand what is the uh, uh, alignment between the CFO and CIO, particularly today, when they really need to sit together and 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 uh, their meeting is not more pertinent than what it is today. Uh, that is one aspect of the discussion that we have. Why talk about that? What is also important that how financial function as a standalone function uh, remains efficient and contributes to the shared services and the financial operations in a way that they are not only uh, cost effective, but they are also uh, digitally more, uh, I would say, induced with capabilities to bring in better connect between accounting and management practices. And uh, we have heard about PEGA, one of our partners with whom we have worked in the area of business process engineering and business process management. And today, Pega uh, works with uh, many of our customers in the tech segment in business process transformation 
and automation. And he has Sir Rich, uh, who is the principal and director uh, for Pega, uh, particularly the management ma manufacturing segment. Will talk about uh, the benchmarks that are emerging in many of the financial practices, which is driven by automation and better workflow practices that are being brought in. So I think it's going to be an exciting session. We're going to hear about the planning and financial alignment that's becoming so important in this backdrop of resilience. And at the same time, we are going to hear about how finance as a function is really uh, gearing up to provide a more efficient and agile services in a, to, to the transformation that is underway. To help me in this discussion, I have my colleague, Kalol Basu, who is uh, uh, also an industry advisor for TCS, and he will help us curate some of the questions you may have today and bring it to context so that we get to hear from Phil and Sandra. So over to you, uh, Phil, and uh, thanks, Kalol, for joining me in this session. Great, thanks so much for the introduction. I, I really appreciate that. Um, maybe if we go to the uh, the next slide, Carl, um, you know, we can, uh, again, uh, I was just introduced and talked a little bit about my, uh, my background and, you know, kind of coming at this from the perspective of, um, you know, having, been you know in finance as a qualified you know charter management accountant, um, and you know having worked you know with as a CIO and in you know senior operations positions, I kind of got this unique position where I could I've seen many sides of the equation here. Um, so you know today we're going to be discussing the alignment between IT, the business, and the context of you know how we're working together on technology, people, and data change programs. And, you know, I think what I'm really going to talk about is I'm going to use the context of business initiatives um, that's going to help us talk about kind of alignment and agility and how that all comes together. So starting off here and again, you know, talking about programs and, and how we how we drive agility, getting to the start line is a big hurdle, right? So, you know, having this shared ownership of decision making between the CFO and the COO and CIO is a, is a big deal and it's not to be underestimated. You know, at the beginning of a program and getting things together and getting people aligned, you know, it takes longer than you might expect. Um, you definitely need that kind of early stakeholder engagement and alignment. Um, and having that collaboration is like super important to make sure that everybody is, is on the same page and you can't start that early enough. You can't run these programs in, in isolation. Um, I think one of the things I found really, really great to kind of get everybody to rally around change is putting in place kind of internal marketing programs that kind of, you know, really, really kind of gives some people something to kind of get hold of with it within an organization. Um, and even at the early stages before something's really kind of kicked off and gets moving, um, providing regular kind of progress updates to, to stakeholders, you know, across the business in terms of what this means and, and what's going to be coming down the pipe. Because ultimately, if you have without this, if you've got this lack of alignment and lack of clarity, they are some of the biggest enemies of agility that are out there. So, you know, starting the right way, getting off on the right foot is um, is very uh, is very key here. So if we go to the uh, the next slide um, and, you know, and, and it can seem like this sometimes, but it's not IT against the business, right? It's, it's, it's about winning together. Um, you know, and and operating together, you know, other stakeholders, like some of the ones I just talked about, um, do need to be vested in a, in a program success. It's very easy to, to operate in silos. Um, you know, we can, we all kind of, you know, default to that way of working. Um, but again, like I said, the other stakeholders need to be vested in, in this programs, in a program success. And I think people need to understand what's in it for me and being able to explain that clearly, I think really, really kind of helps. Um, the business and IT, and when I say the business, that could be finance, it could be operations, it could be marketing, other parts of the organization. Those pieces of the business need to be aligned on what change is needed. Um, and, you know, and focus on, you know, what, where is it in terms of the people process um, data and technology, which aspects are relevant where and how does that come together? It, you can't make these things just an IT project. And I'm sure many of you have experienced that, right? If you, IT is running off doing their thing, you know, you are really not going to get the best results. And, and that's really not how it should, how it should work. 
So, um, you know, the leadership needs to be visible from a CFO or a COO. And I think, like I said, it's bringing everybody together with that same mission. I think having kind of shared communications across all groups within a business is critical and, and making it very relevant for each business team. Um, yes, you can have generic messaging and so on, but certainly, you know, if you're communicating with a finance audience, then making sure that those teams understand what it means for finance. Um, and again, it's, it's trying to be very crisp about the uh, about the message. The, you know, as you get drive alignment and, and try and bring everyone together, it's not just about it being at the executive level. This is all the way down through the organization. And, you know, again, it's very difficult sometimes to drive that. I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. But, you know, everybody kind of needs to feel like they're involved in, in the process. So you don't want IT just left kind of pushing a program uphill by themselves. Um, you know, you're not going to be successful that way. So I think, you know, getting this kind of um, the state, all of the right stakeholders involved is going to lead to a much more um, successful and kind of collaborative um, initiative across the business. So you just move to the next slide. Um, so who makes the decisions around here? Um, one of the things that I've, I've seen is global process ownership is really key to increasing agility. Um, as you're going, as you're driving programs to move quickly, you need very clear process ownership. It's not all about technology, right? I think, you know, the technology and especially, um, if you're in an IT organization, you can become very technology obsessed. Um, and that's, that's what it all becomes about, but processes is really, really important. Um, so kind of, you know, making sure that focus is there and the human side of programs is I found is, is often underestimated. Um, so, you know, for me, that's, you know, a big passion of mine is making sure that the people side of programs is something that we, you know, really consider in addition to, you know, look, yes, we can be passionate about technology and what that's going to derive, but we've got to bring people along on these journeys and, you know, and, and that's, and that, that ultimately, you know, I think is a, a deal breaker in terms of whether you're going to be successful or not. So in terms of this concept of global process ownership, I think, you know, these Global, our processes that we have in our business are very complex, right? They can and they span lots of areas of, of an organization. Um, and the owners may not actually be, you know, necessarily be an expert in that area. You may have someone, you know, leading the um, the marketing kind of um, thread where an awful lot of it is reliant on finance. So they therefore you've actually got a finance leader in place. But I think it's really important to have a single owner so that people know who to go to. Now that that single owner can be supported by subject matter experts. Um, you know, to, to kind of build out a wider team and, and, and build more bandwidth, but ultimately having a single point of accountability responsibility um, really helps with that, that decision making. And as, as you go through, um, go through a, a program. As an example, when I, I was driving an Oracle cloud ERP program um, and within there, you know, kind of global organization, 9000 employees. Um, you know, um, multinational and we created, we actually ended up creating, I think, eight or nine global process owners. And, you know, so, and then ultimately everybody knew for that particular part of the process, that's who they go to. And again, they, those processes in a number of cases spanned lots of different parts of the organization. Um, but what it really helped do in, in that case, we also built a steering group for those process owners and an escalation path so that, you know, ultimately that things are going to change as, and, and go wrong as, as you're going through an initiative um, making sure everyone knew who was, who was basically making the decisions or who they could go to to make sure the right decisions were made really helped move things along and increase the velocity of decision making. And I think that worked really well. And so having that absolute clarity was uh, was a really great thing. And I think the other, the other one, the other thing just to kind of mention here, um, I'm sure many of you have um, heard about, you know, kind of Amazon's two pizza rule, right? Where, you know, if you've got a team of people driving an initiative, um, you know, ideally you don't want more people than it takes, you know, two pizzas to feed. Um, and Amazon have actually kind of progressed that theory over time and kind of moved to this concept of the single threaded leader, um, which kind of plays into what I was just talking about, about global process ownership, having kind of a single threaded leader who's kind of responsible and accountable and focused on that task really does deliver better results. And ultimately, again, it allows things to, to drive along much more successfully. So, and, and I know that's challenging, you know, in, in certain environments based on, you know, kind of funding and, and, you know, kind of what, who can be freed up to work on things. But if you're driving towards trying to move quickly, 
um, and trying to, you know, kind of drive for bigger success. I think that's a, a really kind of key decision to be made early on. Um, moving on to the next slide. Does everybody know what we're doing and why? And again, this is kind of some of the, the human element of, of programs, right? And it's about communications and clear business outcomes. So the need to set very clear objectives is, I think, is paramount. I think as, as you go through um, kind of change programs, it's easy to lose sight um, of the key goals as the program runs and people start going down rat holes. And then all of a sudden you're wondering about what you started in the first place. So I think, you know, making sure that, you know, again, everyone's very clear on, on what the, uh, the objectives are going to be. But then also it means that as the, if things do change and, you know, things clearly do, then you're able to go back to a clear set of objectives and rationalize the change you're making against them to make sure you're still on the right path. I think, look, keeping it simple is, is super critical. Um, the wider organization is going to kind of lose interest and buy into a complex and drawn out program. So, you know, really trying to kind of focus in is um, is, is important. Um, and get teams excited for what's coming and what, what it means for them. Again, this is a great opportunity to get everybody to rally around, uh, you know, what, what can be, you know, a really kind of step change for an organization. Um, I think one of the negatives here could be that you know, people do worry about what change means for their role and we can't overestimate, you know, the, the, what that means for individuals. I think, you know, being very clear up front about upcoming change um, with with organizations is, you know, if you can do that is is really important. And then that leads to reskilling and retraining if needed, you know, and, and it's actually a good opportunity where you may have, especially in organizations that have been around for some time, you may have people that have been using certain technologies and, and ways of working for a number of years. Actually, what you're giving people here is an opportunity to step up and move to a, you know, move to a whole new subset of um, of, of technology and, and ways of working and, and capabilities that they might not have had before. And that's, you know, very motivational and exciting. And, you know, the people that you have in organizations, they know the way the company works, they know the people, they know how to get things done. If you're then giving them the ability to learn something new and really upskill, you know, I've certainly seen that's where, you know, really kind of uh, helps people shine. And I think it really kind of motivates people it can be really great. A couple of um, examples that I've used teams to, to understand the why of why you're doing certain things. Um, one for me was certainly in, in supply chain, which, you know, we, we touched on at the beginning, um, especially, you know, with the velocity of change and the way things are happening um, within, you know, one of the businesses I was um, driving, there was, there really was a critical need to move to more real time planning. Things were just moving too slowly. Um, and so explaining to the supply chain teams, this is what you're going to get. This is what it looks like. These are the kind of you know ways you're going to be able to work really kind of helps people get excited about um, about what's coming and, and gets again, gets people more bought in. Um, the other one was, you know, we were a large organization, a um, lot of M&A going on, but again, kind of supported by legacy systems. And one of the things that we, you know, rallied around with the finance teams was around the more efficient GL hierarchy that we were building. And that was going to significantly simplify and, and, you know, everybody's lives in, in the finance group. And, you know, th that team were very aligned with, yeah, look, we absolutely need it. We see why we need it. We want to be part of it. And that really helped build on, on the success of what we were driving. So making things very relevant to those teams, I think, uh, you know, really helps as you're progressing. So next slide. And everyone needs to be on the bus. So we need everybody, everybody on this together. We don't, we don't want kind of people either running in different directions or feeling like they're not part of what's going on. And change management, I think, is, a, is at the heart of that. And change management is one of those terms I think people throw around and maybe um, use it a little bit too lightly. Um, and because it is super critical and it can make a huge difference to, you know, how successful you can be. Um, it's critical to bring everyone on the journey. And I think especially to reduce internal conflicts and be able to move with agility, you know, having the right process in place um, really kind of, you know, streamlines things. Um, as I said, change is going to be made as you progress through a program. So having a good mechanism to be able to react um, to changing internal factors and external factors um, is, uh, is super important. Um, you need fast decision time SLAs. So making sure that, again, let's keep things moving. Let's work in an agile fashion. And if, if um, issues don't get resolved, then 
what's the escalation path if you don't hit that SLA? Again, it's trying to make sure that um, that you're you're progressing through a program. Um, I did a lot of creating of roundtables, surveys, briefings, and regular comms to allow for teams to participate in what we were doing. Um, and look, and, and the most significant changes can you know can kind of be escalated up to a a change board where the CXO team can make sure again everything's aligned back to goals and outcomes. Um, but I think escalation should be seen as a positive thing, and it gives people the ability again to see that they're part of the process and not being ignored. Um, as you're going through change, um, you may discover that staff don't have the skills needed to operate in different ways. And, you know, I think there's decisions need to be made early on about retraining and rehiring. Um, again, I think some of these things are quite challenging topics, but they need to be kind of at the forefront of mind. Um, and also being very cognizant of workload, you know, investments um, in dedicated teams may be needed and burning people out is just going to lead to a lack of caring or lack of enthusiasm and attrition in teams. So, again, it, it may be, you know, just don't ignore these things. Make sure they're part of a comprehensive view of how you're going to go about driving change and driving a program because without it again without everyone on the bus then friction which inevitably will be you know one of the outcomes can really slow your progress so next slide and i think as so as you're then driving through a program um i think I, i'm a big fan of the minimum viable product approach and you know making sure the like, programs can't be measured in years anymore, right? Programs have to move really quickly. Um, you, you know, everything's not going to be perfect, but I think understanding the smallest subset of functionality to be able to operate is, is a great way to, uh, to move forward. So you can get up and running. Maybe it's just one customer you can get up and running with. Maybe it's one segment of your business, but then you're proving out that the intersection between technology and people and data is all working. And, you know, that gives you the ability in some cases to fail quickly on a small case on a small scale before you start to deploy it widely. And you look, and in some cases, you know, maybe you do end up running it, running your new process and you may still have to, you know, use some spreadsheets or whatever it is you've relied on in the past to kind of get you over the hurdle. And I don't think you should be afraid of that as long as you're continuing to make progress and drive things forward. Um, I was actually reading a post this morning um, from uh, someone at Amazon. Um, which I thought was really interesting um, that they because and resonated with me that they they instead of the minimum viable product approach at Amazon, um, they've actually adopted the term of minimum lovable product approach, which maybe I should have put in here because I kind of like that. Um, but they, they like the idea they kind of adopting this idea that minimum viable product kind of you know people maybe don't necessarily like what what you're putting in place, but they kind of live with it. Minimum lovable product is actually the kind of the subset of and functionality that people they can, they can kind of they, they live with and they will embrace and be excited about so maybe that's a, a term that more of us should be using so i thought that was kind of neat um i mean an example of um a, of a program i was involved in where you know we were deploying salesforce crm in a number of call centers um and again in in light of trying to move quickly we we just put, put kind of swivel chairing in place right so you know the team started using the capabilities and the technology um, and until all the functionality was in place, yes, they were going back and they were going back to using some of their old system, but it kept things moving. It got training, you know, kind of progressed. Um, it gave us additional feedback as we were developing um, and, you know, and ultimately allowed us to kind of move move forward quickly. So I think, you know, MVP or um, MLP is, uh, is, is pretty cool. Um, next slide. So this is when you get into the kind of um, into the crux of it, probably, you know, why you're doing all of this change around it, agile, intelligent planning. And, you know, and it's really about achieving enterprise resilience with fast, flexible and effective planning. So, you know, in today's business environment, you just can't rely on ways of working of the past. You need to make early, fast decisions and you, and you can't have human intervention um, slowing processes down. Um, you have to automate. And you have to use best in class processes or or at least take if you can't take something off the shelf that's best in class process map out what you have to the, you know, to to really simplify how things operate. And having friction or, you know, any sort of manual inputs in your process is is really, you know, is, is to be avoided and and something that the that teams need to focus on. And, you know, in technologies such as robotic process automation, RPA, you know, they can support your objective, right, in terms of what you're driving in, in addition to enterprise systems. Um, but as part of this, I think understanding what are your key business drivers, right? And, and 
how do those business impact kind of drivers impact what you're doing on a real time basis? I think building those into um, into your kind of new roadmap, so to speak, is really going to support you because look, you can't control market conditions, right? Even with all the craziness going on in the world and supply chain and so so on at the moment, you know, you can't control that. You need to be able to manage it. But if you've built the right variables into your process from the outset and you can feed that data into your model, you're going to be in a much better position to react. And again, all of that data is flowing into a system without getting caught up, you know, in, in terms of in any kind of manual gates. Again, you're going to be able to move much, much more quickly and you're not going to be in this position where you're making late decisions. Um, a couple of, you know, where I've seen um, really good kind of results as a, as a um, from moving to kind of real time decision making, our um, uh, supply chain teams kind of implemented Oracle Planning Central, where you you know you're in feeding all your data from whether it be from Salesforce from the front end demand side or from your factories from the back end supply supply side, and ultimately you're just putting in front of people decision maker dashboards where instead of kind of piecing everything together, what everyone's doing they're coming in in the morning, they're seeing kind of critical items and making key decisions and keeping the process running based on the key decisions that uh, that need to be made in an organization. It's not about kind of in, in, it's not about the actually changing the process it's about inputs into the process so you know that really kind of helped move things along and kind of pretty exciting to see or otherwise you know um, we did some work on, with tableau and building out kind of real-time inventory analytics um, again to make fast decisions based on the information in front of you and you know again teams see the benefit of that so i think the crux of all of this kind of all of the the, you know, the agility of what we're trying to achieve is really bringing all bringing all of our data together in a seamless way, streamlined, you know, without manual kind of intervention, so that we we can spend our time making intelligent decisions and doing, you know, and and driving agile, intelligent planning. And um, so this is where this, the technology strategy does need to be well thought out, because um, you don't want to be kind of going back and doing reworks later or kind of adding functionality later. And this is a great opportunity to get things right in the in the first place. So then kind of closing out, lastly, I'd say, look, make it fun, right? You know, people, you know, again, what all, all the change you're driving in a business, it's, it's, it can be exciting and, you know, it can bring, you know, new ways of working, new skills to people. So, you know, celebrate successes, you know, showcase the advantages and the, the, the advances that you're going to be making in uh, technology and functionality. Um, and bring teams together informally. It's probably, you know, it's becoming a little easier to do that now. Some of the restrictions are being lifted, but especially cross-functionally, bring together, you know, the finance groups and the operations groups and the IT groups and bring them together to have just informal conversations leads to, you know, great outcomes. So, I, I you know, and also emphasize fast decision making and fast progress. And some of that can be showcased, right? So, you know, we had, uh, we put in place um, what we called the um, wall of success, which was awesome, right? It was just on our intranet and we showcased individuals who um, kind of epitomized some of the kind of the key, key um, skills that we were looking for. And they talked about what they were doing. And, you know, and again, it drove conversations in the business and, you know, it was, um, was really cool to see. And I think people really enjoyed hearing about the change and what people were achieving. So um, just to wrap up on the last slide, so, and, and in summary, so, you know, having talked about business and IT alignment through agile business planning. So, you know, do the work early in a program to get alignment, make sure that everyone knows what's in it for them. Be clear about ownership decisions and outcomes. Um, you know, consider the, the minimum viable product approach and, you know, if possible, try and move click quickly. Um, leverage the, less, the latest technology to remove friction from your processes and make sure that those key business drivers are considered upfront. And have fun as you're moving to these, these new ways of working. So uh, hopefully that's been insightful and given you guys a, a few kind of, again, that's just from my experience of kind of driving some, you know, fast moving programs. Um, and it's been great speaking to you all. So with that, um, Carol, why don't we go to the uh, audience polls? Thank you, Phil, uh, for this wonderful ad um, address. Uh, we will we ran a poll uh, during your speech so to, to get a feel of what the audience is audience believes on this topic. So we would like to display the audience poll results. Okay, so we have the audience poll results. So Phil, your comments. On, on the audience poll? Yes. I mean, it pretty much resonates what you were, um, uh, what you were uh, discussing all this while, so. For sure. 
Yeah, I think so. so what we say so. So, what has greatly impacted connected planning in your business? So, better at business outcomes through increased top line. I think that's you know that's kind of clear, right? What are the measures taken by the technology organisations to improve the IT and business synergies in the recent past? Um, IT leadership collaborating with the diverse business units to prioritise IT projects. Yeah, I think that that kind of collaboration is uh, you know as I talked through there, you know it, it you know it, it's not about just IT. A lot IT are at the core of a lot of this, and actually I think a lot of our organisations now have IT embedded. Um, you know, within the businesses, right, and have have leaders within the business who are those kind of bridges, um, which I think uh, is uh, really, really, really helping us. Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, we have, uh, we will just take a couple of questions. So the first question comes from Greg. Um, uh, he believes that almost, he uh, notes that almost one third of all the CIOs, they report to CFOs, but there is a lack of alignment. So when the businesses are working in silos, how can our projects uh, meet the expectations? Now that, that is a good one. Yeah, and, and I mean, I was lucky enough in the past when I was a CIO to actually report to the CEO. So, you know, I, I didn't have that as much. Although, you know, as I've spoken to, you know, other CIOs and other leaders in, in IT, I think one of the ways of, of working through that, I think, you know, look, Yes, it's quite hierarchical and it can be challenging, you know, if, if you're kind of siloed within finance. I think it's, you know, it's up to CIOs to take it upon themselves to build those relationships with others in the business. And it can either be done informally or formally. I think there's a formal way where, you know, looking and certainly, you know, I've seen situations where just because you are not kind of necessarily, you know, on a par with the CFO or, or COO and so on, you know, you can certainly participate and ask to participate in executive team meetings and kind of work as an informal member of that team, especially if you are driving a big cross-functional change program, sometimes getting that visibility to the CEO and, and that direct executive team can be really helpful. So I think, you know, talking to, you know, talking with the CFO and kind of getting alignment such that you can actually join some of those team meetings and up level again on an, you know, it's kind of in for, it's with formal meetings, um, but it's, you're not necessarily formally joining the executive team. I think that's one good way to, to get alignment or other way. Otherwise, it's really a case of kind of, you know, building your own internal company network and spending time, you know, speaking with the, the, um, the C the the, um, the the CIO or the CFO and the COO bringing those people together and you know just just spending time you know calling people it's not not all about email right you just need to get on calls or video calls and talking to people and making sure that you are aligned on your objectives and and you know and it's not easy right there's there's a lot of work involved in doing that kind of behind the scenes networking. Um, but that's, you know, certainly what I've done in a lot of my roles, you know, you, you do spend a lot of time working with other leaders, understanding their issues. And so that, again, you can knock down, you can kind of make these programs have less friction as you're driving them um, to. But but it's up to you as, an, as, a, as a leader to bring all of those pieces together, I think. Thank you, Phil. I hope that clarifies. Uh, the second question is. How can um, in a technology organization, um, in, a, in a devices or a, a networking company, how can agile planning drive business co co continuity? How can you combine agility and res resilience through agile planning? So I, th I think the the um, the resiliency piece at the moment is is very relevant. I think you know certainly in in the uh, kind of consumer devices and and uh, you know kind of networking business you know a lot of people are in 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 the position where um silicon you know the folks like TSMC cannot produce enough parts whether they're all you know uh, intel and and samsung and so on you know they literally can't produce enough silicon there's shortages in the market there's lots of logistics challenges with you know kind of not being able to get enough capacity on on ships and so on to get products to where you need them to be um i think you know I think you can take the the same approaches that I talked about in terms of bringing teams together to try and solve this problem. And I think it, maybe it's, and I think, you know, and I've, I've actually had a lot, a lot of discussions about this recently. Um, I think it's one of these areas where people have got used to a kind of working in supply chains as, you know, kind of just in time and the, the machine works right and the machine just rolls. Um, I think we're now at a place where people are having to rethink that. You know, with the environment that's just, you know, that we're going through, is this going to be the last time it happens like this with major worldwide shortages? Probably not. But and I don't think people have done enough work around kind of resiliency 
and what that means for organizations and you know kind of figured out how do they continue running their operations and there are a lot of companies now saying look i'm willing to pay x amount more if i can guarantee delivery of y product right um and so and the challenge is that everyone today is so they're so in the day to day right now trying to solve all of their problems um nobody's really spending enough time saying okay what happens when we get out of this or what does the next one two three years look like look like so i think trying to kind of like i talked about with the single threaded leader trying to identify someone who can take on this challenge think it through in the context of an organization and you know and then figure out okay how are we going to drive levels of resiliency create a team around it build stakeholders build engagement it's, it's the same kind of process as, as any other program but it's super critical right now and i think if you're not if you you know haven't already been through that or if you're not driving it then then you're kind of behind in the evolution of the supply chain and and that that's that's you know going to be the conversation topic of conversation for the next 12 to 18 months for sure Thank you, Phil, uh, for this uh, wonderful address. Uh, it was a pleasure having you. So we would like to move to the next half of the session, which revolves around finance process automation for the tech industry. Thank you, Phil, it, um, for all your thoughts, and I'm sure this is this is really benefit the, benefited the audience out here. Thank you. So with this, um, uh, I would like to hand it over to Shivaji. If you could kindly set the context for the second session, which is finance process automation for the tech industry. Thanks, uh, um, uh, thanks, uh, Kalon. And uh, the fifth session has set the context so well. Honestly speaking, what we see today is that while we have executive level collaboration with a common manifesto, uh, there is a uh, simultaneous uh, business uh, change management and agile delivery which has to work in harmony and uh, uh, Sandra coming to you we always have seen or usually we have seen Pega is one of these tools which is driving business change from a, at a process level by you know deploying workflows and it has always it has usually been a tool tool of choice for rapid application development of, uh, which we may call agile in a way to come up with those uh, dynamic process requirements and and eventually meet the business demand. So, come uh, bringing it within the context of finance, uh, uh, one you know important expectation which comes from uh, um, tools uh, makers like uh, Pega is how is uh, these tools being adequately leveraged. Uh, um, you know, in, in finance functions and shared services. And when we talk about tools, we're talking about the automation aspects, the ability to come up with agile, rapid application development, deploy processes, which may have more complex rules at the same time can be, uh, can be tailored and made flexible, not compromising with some of the best practices that we bring in. So we would like to hear from you. What is your experience here? and what kind of benchmarks should we look forward to and what kind of uh, probably areas where they should be applied to. Over to you, uh, Sandra. So I hope you can see my screen now. Um, good afternoon, if you're in EMEA. Good morning, if you're on the West Coast of the US and happy coffee break if you're located somewhere in between. Thank you, Shivaji, for the nice introduction and the warm words. My name is Sandra. I work for PEGA in the manufacturing vertical, and the tech sector for us is part of manufacturing. I'm based in Munich, Germany, so it's roughly 5.40 p.m. for me here. In my work, I support account executives, I support PEGA partners, prospects, and customers. And part of my role is thought leadership in positioning PEGA, capturing trends, and um, setting in perspective how our customers can uh, best benefit from both process innovation and both technology. I'm very happy and honored to be here today and speak about uh, finance process automation. So today's series is about the future of finance. Um, I would like to add the future of finance is in full swing. Leaders are shaping their organizations to make them future ready. And with one leg, a typical CFO is responsible for keeping the books and records accurately on time 
process massive transactions in a so-called finance fabric. So that's uh, books and records, financial reporting, monthly, quarterly, annual statements, compliance, investor relations. With the other leg, the CFO, who is more than a mere accountant, has become a business advisor influencing corporate strategies. He or she owns business cases that justify investments, prioritizes funding based on um, uh, return on investment, and thus shapes the future of their company. Further, the CFO owns the metric system for monitoring the goal achievements. In between, um, there's pressure to master cost savings, competition, technology, disruption, and so on. And digitalization is expected to reduce the corporate headcount by about 30%, especially in clerical jobs. So that becomes a huge responsibility. Also, uh, in parallel, new business models are appearing. We see, for example, in ZPG, traditional B2B companies who serviced wholesalers are now entering the direct-to-consumer market. Um, in the tech sector, for example, in aftermarket services, we see a lot of SaaS subscriptions. So that multiplies the number of invoices that go out and have to be settled uh, every month and thus pushes a, a huge pressure on scaling up the finance fabric. At the same time, 70% of all digitalization projects fail. Yet digital transformation and mastering it becomes a huge opportunity for CFOs who manage digital leadership in their finance department, they can become evangelists and innovation catalysts for the rest of the company. They may embrace technology as an enabler uh, that frees up some of their time and their team's time to let them focus on what finance does best or should do best, and that's becoming the business um, partner. The journey has begun quite a while ago. And I wanted to take a quick quiz. Since you're silent or on mute, uh, it will be a silent quiz. The question is, how would you rate the cost savings that finance departments have achieved during the past decade? I'll give you a pause. And then show you the result. Um, it's 25% of cost reduction over the past 10 years. And I was really surprised when I first read that. That's a huge achievement. I would call it blood, sweat and tears. Um, and as always with benchmarking, the winning, depend, uh, the winning potential depends on the starting position. If you compare that to Formula One, the pole position is obviously different uh, from the third row starting point um, in order to uh, win the race. So the interesting thing here is that both average performing companies and leading companies have made similar progress. The, 25% reduction in cost. Um, if we look forward on the carrot, what is the untapped automation potential that's still ahead of us? And instead of um, giving it another quiz, uh, I just thought I'd simply show you the response. Boston Consulting has done an analysis across all support function and finance being one of it shows um, an additional savings potential of 30 to 40 percent and a whooping one-third reduction in working capital that is still possible. Working capital is the critical metric how lean the company operations is run and especially for the finance team in accounts receivable we see a huge lever with a days of sales outstanding metric. If we want to dive a little, dip, a little bit deeper into the finance function. McKinsey has analyzed um, the sub-functions of finance and um, has shown where the automation potential lays in there. And um, not so surprisingly, all high volume transactions, um, let's say general accounting operations, accounts receivable, accounts payable, um, have an automation potential of all manual employee activity of about larger than 75%. Um, let's take a wild guess that it won't take another three decades to capture it. My last slide on benchmarking is from Deloitte. Um, they have surveyed just this year a lot of large corporations, um, irrespective of their industry background, 
how many headcount they have in local subsidiaries they have in headquarter and they have bundled together in a shared services or GBS model. And the numbers have increased gradually over the last couple of years, but this year it's around 60% of headcount that's in a shared service. And that's corresponding to the um, finance factory that I've mentioned before. Shared services have helped tremendously to bring down the costs in that operations or finance fabric. But eventually we have to admit that the shared services model has reached its limit to further reduce costs by labor arbitrage. The labor cost is going up and high turnover rates have become a problem. So obviously everybody's looking into process automation for getting to the next level. To capture that potential, um, we expect to see, of course, some digitally enabled futuristic bionic processes, i.e. a mix of automation between human and robotic value add. But before jumping ahead, I would like to point out what we in PEGA observe as guiding principles for intelligent automation. So we don't end up cementing the processes, but we simplify the processing first. In PEGA, we call this crushing complexity. So my first principle is automating process variants, which may be fully legitimate for business units or certain brands for special customers and the special needs for regions, local regulation and for certain products. And for many years, we have been told we first have to standardize or otherwise we cannot get automation, especially with monolithic ERP system and legacy systems. But these processes are mere variations and must also be turned into a no-touch processing. For example, Cisco, one of PEGA's prominent high-tech customers, has removed inefficient human touches from uh, more than 80% of their partner order to cash cases, which shows us it can be done. The second principle for true exceptions of a process or semi-automated processing a human interaction should be only used to add value in a way to delight internal and external customers, to foster loyalty, reduce churn, to increase upsell, cross-sell, to differentiate. And to do so, the users will gladly accept help. So imagine a single cockpit, guided steps and warning of further approvals of my actions further downstream or any issues my data entry might cause with data validation after I save it. All that aims to prevent rework and helps me to prioritize my tasks and make the right actions. In Cisco terms, these are the remaining less than 20% of cases that also need some um, um, automation. Oops, sorry, I was going too fast. Numbers, of course, may vary depending on the process details and on the sub-processes or the exceptional processes. And the journey is the goal here. We see lots of customers, particularly in high tech, which um, have a mindset that is generally more tech affine. They are leveraging advanced analytics and process mining to visualize improvement uh, opportunities for what is called a digital fit rate. The digital fit rate is a common metric to account for human touches per transaction. And obviously, the less human touches one transaction needs, the better. And thirdly, we see a fundamental principle in optimizing not only within one function, like within the finance or accounts receivable, but across the end-to-end -end workflow from order entry to cash received. That's like finding a global optimum versus optimizing locally with the local search resulting in suboptimal results, as we've learned in math. Often this requires bridging gaps between systems and siloed organizations, and this is an agile and modular approach with a low-code platform and reusable micro journeys. The guiding principles may then be applied to technology, and there are quite many technologies available, like robotic process automation, like machine learning, like artificial intelligence, like optical character recognition, and so on. But then there is no green field. There are already systems in place, and we remember the blood, sweat, and tears, as I had called it earlier, that got us where we are today. And that got us um, the 25% savings of the last decade. 
And there are numerous backend systems uh, for the heavy lifting in our finance factory. Instead of ripping them out, uh, they could use some agile wrapping around. Where staff is involved, we'd want to route to the best skill set available and prioritize on which tasks this team should work first. Rules and process guardrails should be easily configurable and inheritable to sub-processes. We'd like to see artificial intelligence applied to the process outcome in order to preview the results of our processing and our actions. It would be neat to see all workflows auditable and status reporting included. And any change like tax regulation should be easy to reconfigure in a low, can low code manner. And not to forget making all configuration reusable like Lego bricks. So far, we've reviewed benchmarks and concept. Let's now use the remaining time to dive into two examples, which I brought from a well-known Munich-based company um, in the technology sector. Siemens is very active um, as a PEGA practitioner. And the first example is on the supplier side for the purchase to pay process. It was delivered in phases and with the first module for accounts payable, they went live in August last year after nine months of implementation. So we see the first savings of the accounts payable team. 20% efficiency gains translating into roughly the same number of increased automation, 25% in cycle time reduction and 85% less errors on roughly 20 million invoices paid per year to the suppliers. Before this project, optimization within the finance function got to an automation rate of already 40%. So one could say that's a lot and stop there, but with end-to-end, -end, it is now much higher. The staff can see data issues on one click. If the account is not available, for example, that needs to be paid, or check if the supply is still authorized to receive money. They can trigger urgent payment methods as just another variant to the standard payment process. They may root exceptions which need manual intervention to the best suited team. They prioritize work for an accounts payable employee who is considered an exception worker. Or APIs can easily be docked on, for example, to auto translate if a spot check is needed on a document that is in another language. So the good news here is Siemens GBS offers accounts payable as a service to process other companies' supplier bills. And Siemens basically and not PEGA is selling this service. And um, as you can see, Siemens has decided that uh, the optimization following our guided uh, our guidelines from before um, should be end to end. So as a procure to pay and not just as a within finance function. The second example I brought to you is on the customer side, the end-to-end -end order to cash process. Again, it was delivered in phases and it started already in 2016 for 11 service centers around the world. And meanwhile, the master data part, the order management and stunning are fully live. As we are focusing on finance today, let's dive into cash collection and cash collection management is of course an exception process to order to cash as the majority of the 10 million customer invoices get paid on time and are settled automatically, which is quite often the case within B2B high-end uh, transaction processing. So before the Dunning was mainly Excel-based or with the help of SAP. However, there are some simple actions like extracting a second copy of an invoice to send by email to a customer that took before more than four minutes and could now be reduced to a mere 17 seconds. And for those who have worked in accounts payable before, they know that quite a high number of all requests that uh, come in into the accounts payable team are asking for a second copy of the invoice because it got lost, it got routed to the wrong uh, channel or um, the person is on vacation. Now Siemens takes advantage of regional differences um, and these are mere process variants. 
In the UK, Dunning agents use the phone. In Canada, it is strictly by email. And for the US, there are still checks accepted as a payment method. There is a cockpit to jump to functionalities which, for example, allows to change the order limit in master data in case there are any doubts on credit worthiness um, that arise. They get a segmentation of outstanding receivables and know which ones to work first, and they can have automated reporting for aging receivables. Agents may clarify issues on outstanding payments with customers or share the dunning steps with the sales team who is obviously interested to learn any steps that might jeopardize any future deals. There is documentation accessible beyond a personal email inbox, for example, a potential consolidation for legal action, or if an agent is on PTO, uh, another agent can just pick up. Again, Siemens is very open to sell this cash collection management application for interested companies. Now, this brings me to my last slide. For those who haven't heard about us, PECA is a Boston-based business process management company. The core of our manufacturing offering is intelligent automation platform with rule-based decisioning, robotic process automation, and process AI, AI. I mean, in a nutshell. Of course, um, this is, there's is more to it, uh, and we can drive into more detail um, after this session. We have many customers bound the tech sector, and if you haven't encountered us in a work environment, chances are you must have come across us as a private consumer, maybe in the background without being aware of it. By paying bills, by applying for credit cards, by driving a car, or by flying on an airplane. So if you have any questions, this is the time, and we will now start with the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Sandra, for this wonderful address. Um, uh, we ran a poll um, uh, as you were speaking, and we would like to display the poll results. So, and we would like to invite your thoughts um, on this. And thank you, audience, for being so uh, involved and engaged. Um, so, Sandra, this is the result that, of the audience poll that we conducted. And of course, a lot of companies have started to optimize um, their finance function uh, during the last decade. So some of them are leading ahead and others um, are still following the basic steps. So it doesn't surprise me that the picture is fairly mixed with a 20% of uh, plan starts and then a 40% who have already experimented with RPA. But let me just say RPA is one side of the um, the solution. There are, of course, other mechanisms or guiding principles that can be applied, so it will be a mix. 25% um, started increasing standardization. Um, that's super good. Let's see where the limits are reached and we need the variance to the standard. Uh, I'd be really uh, curious to discuss that with some of you. And 15% uh, have a finished proof of concept very well. Um, like my previous speaker, Phil, has mentioned before, PEGA is a huge fan of minimum lovable products, as we call it too, and an agile approach. So um, going live with a first phase never means stopping. It always means there's a long journey ahead. We look on the other one. Which organizational function is leading RPA initiative? Okay. 15% responded with multiple business units. I think that's great and corresponds to Phil's um, line of thinking that it is a collaborative effort. 15% say finance leadership. Well, it's the finance department, um, so I very much assume so. Uh, multiple business units. And what's a bit surprising is that the IT team is leading the initiative uh, very well, 45%. Thank you, Sandra. We have a, we have an, um, I mean, we have a couple of questions, but uh, the questions are more or less um, on a similar lines. So I will just summarize the questions from. Uh, uh, so how does development of AI play a pivotal role in the overall strategy of finance automation? <laughs> so um, it does obviously. Um, 
well, the first comment that I have is artificial intelligence is a package. Um, so there's a lot of um, things packaged in, and that can be simple rules, um, rule-based decisioning. There can also be some forecasting techniques, and there can be bundled in uh, sophisticated algorithms and machine learning. So it's a mixed bag of things. Mm, which means that some companies have started very early uh, already with uh, some decisioning, some rule-based uh, optimization, and others are still experiencing, experimenting with machine learning. With bots coming up, uh, obviously, then the machine learning will uh, get more interesting role. But again, it very much depends on um, the use case that we want to um, apply it to. And especially with um, artificial intelligence, um, the data that um, it is applied to plays a pivotal role in the data quality. So it will be very interesting to see how we can um, get that um, ahead. Next question. Sure. The next question is, um, uh, Whipple believes that um, the core actual savings are uh, should be much more than 25% because the cost of avoided fraud and error is not really measurable. So uh, he believes the actual, in effect, the, the savings will be much more with automation. The past 25% or the future 75%? The past 25%, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, finance departments are very cautious on um, accepting actual savings if you can't measure it it doesn't count to your business case would be my simple answer to that um, which is why it's so important that at the beginning of a project um, the metrics are clearly defined what are you going to measure what what is the metric status at the beginning of the project and how does it evolve over time okay Thank you. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, Sandra, thank you for this wonderful address. Um, uh, we are running short, uh, uh, we are on, um, uh, we are, we would like to uh, and end our session uh, uh, with Shivaji. Shivaji, if you could kindly summarize the session for us. And Sa once again, Sandra, thank you for this wonderful address. I'm sure the audience has benefited a lot. Thank you so much for having me here and thank you for the questions, wonderful. I, as Phil said, for the next 12 to 18 months, resilience, resilience would continue to be the theme. I think the question more is that as we live up to this challenge, how do we evolve into a new generation of robustness? And when you persona to a marketplace, which may be a little different than what we have seen in the past, this may include things like having the most uh, lovable product, as Phil said, making it more sustainable and more promisable in the market that can hedge the dynamics and risk that comes along and at the same time on the finance side we expect as sandra said so well that finance is not only here to account for the resource allocations that are therein but also to bring in new schematics in the financial capital planning in a way that it is in line with the the business change that is being brought about and i think there's two pole to this one is how it is able to itself come out with uh, more efficient operations within finance and how it can come out with schemes for better resource allocation it's about cash in and cash out and we got some very good benchmarks from sandra on that i'm sure this session you would have you enjoyed it uh, it came from real industry back practitioners and I'm sure uh, it resonates the thoughts of TCS as well as we are riding this change and helping working with customers in resilience and, and working with resilience. Thank you here. Thank you for having us. Have a nice day, all of you.